Hi, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. And I don't know if we've got Scott joining us tonight. I wonder if Scott forgot the, about the time change. Let me just check. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, Ms. Marlin. All right. Well, I texted him, so he may join later. So um, I think we will call the meeting to order uh, for the Shutesbury. Oh, here's Scott. Hi, Scott. Welcome. Hope you feel better. Yeah. Hey, Baron. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Now we, now we can. <laughs> well, welcome. I can't hear you. You can't hear us. Can I? I can hear you, Miriam. Yeah. I can hear you, Miriam. I can hear everyone, <laughs> except, yeah, everyone. <laughs> oh, I guess he just signed back in. All right. All right, Scott, you're here. You can hear us. Yes, yes, no. <laughs> I don't think I think he's having a sound problem. Okay. All right. Well, Scott, um, we're gonna get started. I don't think Scott can hear us. Nope. Mm. All right. Well, um, I don't want to hold up the meeting. So, um, you know, I guess we'll figure that out with him. Um, so I'm calling the meeting to order at 603. And for the recording, this is the Shootsbury Conservation Commission meeting with Miriam DeFont, Beth Wilson, Mary David. Robin Harrington and and Scott Kahn, who can't hear us. Um, <laughs> I just get it working. Oh, okay. So, oh, okay. so Scott can, can, hear, can us. hear us. No, I can. Great, great. But there's a somebody, there's an echo going on here. I don't know what that was about. It stopped. Okay, so um, let's, let me pull up my agenda. Um, give me one sec here sort of disappearing on me. All right, so um, the first thing on our agenda um, is we have scheduled uh, a discussion of an amended order of conditions request for 64 Cushman Road um, for Dandelion Energy and Nate Hurd for a geothermal energy system. This was a permit that we issued last May or June and um, the applicant has come back to us with some revisions to their 
um, procedures that they want approval of. And who's here to represent the project? Uh, hi, Miriam, I'm here, Hannah Kowalski from Dandelion Energy. Hi. Um, so just to summarize what the procedure is, um, there's kind of two steps for an amended order of conditions. What you're requesting is um, for us to alter or uh, revise the order of conditions with some new procedures mm -hmm. and um, for us to make a change to a order of conditions, we have to hold a public hearing, which we've tentatively scheduled for May 25th. Mm -hmm. um, but in the mean for 6 p.m. But in the meantime, we have to make a decision about whether we think this is a minor change um, that can um, that's not a substantial difference that would require a new notice of intent. So if it's a minor change that we can do with the existing notice of intent, then we would have the public hearing. If we made a decision otherwise, that would be a different kettle of fish, I guess. Um, so we just need to discuss this briefly with you. I don't want to relitigate what we're going to cover in the public hearing next in two weeks, but just basically we need to make a decision about whether it's minor or major. Does that make sure, sense, thanks. everybody? Mm -hmm. And we did a site visit um, earlier this week, and that was with Mary, Mary and I, right? So Hannah, would you just like to explain briefly sure what thing. these are that you're requesting? Sure thing. So um, the first thing, this is similar to the uh, amendment we had for the Tom Colt job. We're requesting basically a, a different drill rig on site. Um, this one has just better uh, soil erosion control than our standard uh, sonic drill rig. Um, we're also going to be uh, doing part of the trench through the driveway. So we want to amend the um, notice of intent to include how that's going to get cut and how that driveway is going to get patched once the work is completed. And then um, we're including additional information on how we're going to treat the water that comes out with the drilling cuttings. Um, similar to the Tom Colt job, we're planning on returning it to the ground using silt bags slowly over time to prevent erosion. Um, but that's basically the gist of it. It's same locations uh, for drilling, just different equipment. And we just got the photographs that you sent us for the other project that showed the silt bag. So that was helpful. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. We're doing that. Um, so uh, Mary and I looked at it. I, I think we both agreed that we didn't have any major concerns. Did you have any questions or concerns? And does anyone else have any questions or concerns? From the commission i don't it pretty much looks like it's still the same project it might have a couple different things in it but yeah i don't see that it changes if the project isn't changing okay. um, just, where's the silt bag going to go and the the final um water going to drain to so um when we uh i'll pull up the site plan when we get to the hearing if we do it in uh, two weeks but the plan was to put it um, at the furthest end of the property away from the uh, the stream in the wetland um, and then you know let that water go back to the groundwater table again it's I think it's the north end of the property as far away from the uh, wetlands as we can get okay and I apologize if you can hear my dog here <laughs> Any other questions or comments? And is there any public comments? Okay, so, um, you know, my opinion, I agree, this is a minor change and we should be able to do a quick fix at the public hearing. Um, so would somebody like to make a motion for us to make the determination that it's a minor change? I'll make a motion that the 64 Cushman Road geothermal project, the changes recommended are minor. Is there a second? I second. second. Okay, David. Aye. Defont, aye. Harrington. Aye. Aye. Khan. Khan. Aye. Wilson. Wilson. Aye. Great. 
All right. Well, thank you, Hannah. We'll see you. And you've got the date 6 p.m. on May 25th is the hearing date. Perfect. I'll send out those notices this week. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. All right. Um, we had uh, a couple of waiver requests on the agenda for 615 for Lotto 32. I don't know if Marianne, if you're here, if you, we could start now. Is that all right? That's fine with me. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So this is for the uh, wetland restoration notice of intent, which has been submitted to the Conservation Commission, and that no, that application is now on our town website. And the hearing is scheduled for to open on May 25th, I believe. Did I give you a time? You did. I think it's 630, but I'm sure it's posted on, um, or it'll be posted on the agenda. Um, so. I think that's right. Um, if we have the six o'clock um, uh, public hearing for the other project, um, I think that would be a safe time for us to rely on. So you can go ahead and um, do the abutter notifications with that date. Okay. Um, and there's two waiver requests. One was to waive the fees because this is a municipal project. So let's just take that one first. So, so I just, I sent you a letter yep. um, asking that the fee be waived. Um, and it's the same thing we did with the RDA in the fall, right? Yep. Okay. Okay. Well, would somebody like to make a motion or is there a discussion? I'll make a motion um, to waive the fee for the lot of lot of uh, notice of uh, intent notice of for restoration. restoration. Oh, oh. There is there there's, is echo. There's an echo. There's an echo. Is there two somebody here who okay, it went away. Um is there I'll a second? I'll se I'll second that. Okay. David. Aye. Defont. Aye. Harrington. Aye. Aye. Con. Con. Aye. And Wilson. Uh, Aye. For, for the minutes, can you just say how much that is? What the fee way, what the fee amount was going to be? Yes. I don't have it. Do you, Marianne? Okay. But we, um, it's it's the practice to waive um, fees for municipal projects. I think. All right, and then the second waiver. Would you like to? describe that one Marianne so then th these are requests from April um and uh so it's it's two waivers about the um NOI um and now um let's see let me find those notes um so April has asked uh if there can be waivers. So she sent you plans that are 11 by 17. Your standard language requests um, larger plans, um, but she said the plans are zoomed in well beyond the required scale because these are very, these are small projects. Um, so she asked if you could um, waive the requirement for full size plans. And then she also asked if you could waive the requirement for two foot contours. She said the plans now have three meter contours that were added from the publicly available mass mapper database. Okay. Any comment from anybody? I looked at the NOI that she that's the hard copy she submitted and it's read it's very readable. So I'm not sure we would need a larger copy. I agree. Nope. Yeah, I agree. And and it's um it's a fairly flat piece of property, so I don't think the contours are meaningful. Um, no. Okay, somebody want to make, um, let's, can we bundle it and just um, make one motion for waiving those two requests for the um, site plan documents? I'll make a motion to waive the fee request for the site plan document 
for lot no, of 32. No, not, the, not the fee request for the two changes or the two provisions of the site plan documents, not the fee. Yes, sorry. Yeah. Okay, is there a second? Second. Hey, David. Aye. Defon, I. Harrington. Aye. Aye. Khan. Aye. Wilson. Aye. Okay, thank you. And so we have a site visit scheduled for May 24th. Marianne, is that okay? And April will be joining us? Mm -hmm. Yep, April will be there. I'll be there. Um, and and so is that rain or shine? Do you come out if it's raining with umbrellas? Well, that's a good question. I think we would. We've done it before. Okay, the hearing opens the next day. So, okay. All righty. I'll, I'll find my umbrella just in case. If I have it ready. No lightning. It okay. <laughs> okay. Good. Okay. All right. So, so we'll see. I, I'm, I'm assuming we're going to take a look at what area has been staked out and April will be able to explain to us, you know, how she arrived at the scope for that restoration. Yes. Okay. All right. That sounds good. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So, is that everything you have for me? I think so. That's all I've got. Okay. All right. Thanks so much. Okay. Okay. Um, so um, I'm going to move a couple things on the agenda um, because because um, I'm going to move them. So the first thing I want to move them into chronological order because they weren't in chronological order. So the first thing I wanted to go over is um, the Dudley Pond culvert and the emergency certification request for beaver dam breaching that um, we uh, responded to from the highway department. and. Um, I believe I saw, I see Lois Brown on the call. So I don't know. Um, and Lois Brown is a landowner who owns uh, Dudley Pond and the dam downstream. So welcome Lois. Yep, um, I'm here. <laughs> so um, I'm just gonna summarize kind of the chronology of events and then um, we can talk about the emergency certification. So as you may recall, commissioners, we had um, had some discussion about the upstream culvert. This is the small culvert, not the large box culvert, the small culvert that connects um, an upstream pond to Dudley Pond. I don't think that pond's named. And um, there is a beaver fence that had been installed many years ago by the highway department at that culvert. And, We've observed it on other site visits and discussed that there was beaver activity in that area. Um, and in early April, um, there was some communication with the highway department because they removed some beaver dam material. And in, in the process, um, the beaver fence became damaged or it was damaged before, I'm not sure the order of events. Um, and then at our last meeting, Steve Sullivan shared that at this point, they weren't planning on doing any further work at the culvert, I think is what he said, but there was some observation at that point that there was beaver activity. And then um, on May 2nd, I got an email from Tim Hunting saying that the water level it had been raining for several days. There was the water level was very high in that upstream pond water was getting impounded and that the culvert was at risk of getting flooded. Um, and the highway department wasn't sure about what next steps to take. Um, so I encouraged them to meet with Mary, David and I that day um, and to discuss an emergency certification. So uh, Mary and I met with Tim and Steve that afternoon and discussed a plan whereby they were going to gradually breach the beaver dam and release the water in the culvert slowly. Um, and we did discuss the need to do it gradually, um, but the plan was that they were gonna use heavy equipment to do it. Um, later in the afternoon, I received an email from a Montague Road resident saying that there were some problems. And I went down to look at the site at around 3.30 by myself. And what I observed was that the beaver dam had blown, the, the, around that culvert had blown out. Um, and there was a lot of water um, rushing through the culvert and the water was very high in the downstream pond. Um, 
I went down and looked at the dam myself and I shared with everybody in a site visit form the photographs and they're pretty dramatic. You can see the photographs from yeah. 1.30 in the afternoon to 3.30 in the afternoon. I don't know if you guys looked at those photos. Yeah. Did everybody get a chance to look at them? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, there was, it was dramatic. The amount of water that was coming through the dam, the downstream dam, the, the amount of debris and sediment that was floating across the pond. And there was um, quite a bit of water coming through the stonework of the dam. Um, so um, I contacted Becky Torres um, and was um, advised by her that public safety went and took a, a look at the situation later that afternoon and waited until the water level had dropped down to a safe, what felt like a safe level. Um, so um, that's kind of where we're at. I'm sure that what happened was completely unintentional and you know hard to predict when you are taking a beaver dam out, um, particularly with heavy equipment. It's probably very hard to guarantee that um, you're gonna control the water release level, um, but it is what happened. So. Right. Uh, so our our task tonight, I think, is is we you know we have to ratify the emergency certification that was issued. So I issued an emergency certification that was allowing them to remove the dam material over a two day period. Um, so um, I think that what we heard was that the beavers were right back to that spot the very next day. And it's completely blocked up again, and the water is starting to be impounded. So um, it's it's uh, it's back to where the same situation. Um, so I did have, go ahead. I was just going to say, has the emergency start expired? I know they're good for thirty days. They're good for thirty days, but I wrote it as only a two day, two days of work, because at the time. Um, there wasn't a plan for beyond that. And so they were only asking for um, what, what I think they had thought they were gonna be doing was take out some on day one and then go back on day two and take out some more material. But you know, it, because of the, just the force of the water that was impounded, it just blew right through it. So they didn't come back, I don't think the second day. So it's not still blocked up again though. I so wouldn't look at it. It is? Yeah. It is? Yeah. Oh, it is. I think it is. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. I see uh, Steve's got his hand raised. Steve Sullivan. Yeah, so yeah, we're, the plan for the highway department is to not do anything because now they've built it back up and it's with the waters within three inches of when you you and I had that visit and it they're just going to keep building it back up. So there's nothing we can do without their deceiver. Yep. Have you been able, as do you know if Tim's been able to reach Mike Callahan and communicate with him? Yeah, he has. And he's they've emailed each other a couple of times and but there hasn't been any date set. Okay. I'm sure he's super busy. So yeah, I thought I, he, re um, he recommended that they take it down by hand gradually over time and yeah. And and do something different to replace the beaver um deceiver that was there. Yeah, I, I, Mike Callahan called me last Friday, not not about this issue, but about uh, Lois Brown's um, beaver dam, because there's another beaver dam that Lois Brown is is seeking an emergency certification request for um, for next week. Um, so anyway, he called me about that, and what he shared was that um, he had installed that fence himself under contract with the town originally, and. He said for a while he was doing the maintenance and monitoring of it, but then the town took over maintaining it. Um, his recommendation was that any beaver dam removal be done by hand using hand tools like um, potato rakes and like pitchforks or um, Pulaski axes. Um, and that it be done very gradually, like over a number of hours where you take a little bit of material out, let the water come down a few inches, take a little bit more material out rather than kind of chopping a big hole because there's the potential for what happened, which was like a whole bunch of water just got released. And 
Is there an actual beaver deceiver there or is it just the fence? Is there a, fence. Is there a piece of pipe? It's, there's no pipe, it was just a fence. Yeah, so that's not a beaver deceiver. That no, is not. just a fence and it doesn't really do that much once the beavers get in there and start completely blocking the fence. Right. So what really needs to happen so that the highway department doesn't have to keep going back there pretty much every single day after the beavers build it back up is you gotta hire somebody like Mike um, to put an actual beaver deceiver in that location. That's yeah. just the best fix that there is. Um, yeah. So, said, um, and, and just so people know, Beaver Deceiver is actually a brand name for one of these devices. They're flow protection devices, and there's a bunch of different kinds. And um, Beaver Deceiver is trademarked, I think. Um, but it we all call them that. Um, what he said, and I, this is why I think it'd be great for him to consult with the town, is that he had a couple of suggestions. And one was to put in a flow protection, like a pond leveling um, Float protection device, but he also suggested, and Steve, maybe you can communicate this to Tim, the idea of putting a, a row of large boulders upstream in the middle of the pond for the beavers to build off of away from the culvert, which would um, distract them from uh, the culvert, um, but wouldn't require much maintenance at all. So it could be like a one and done. You, he thought uh, the dis the flow protection device was still a good idea, but in addition, there could be this other um, installation that would be inexpensive for the town to manage. That sounded. Well, we've got we've got a very similar situation in Amherst, and Mike, they put it in, um, and it's a it's a it's a culvert that drains a pond. It gets a lot of drainage. It has a beaver deceiver with a pipe and. The fencing, I mean, we have a few of them in Amherst, but this is just one that comes to mind because we recently had to have it maintained. But basically we haven't had to have it maintained. We had it maintained in 20, 2020. It was installed in like 2015. We just had it maintained again this year because things happen like the pipe will get a little off center or something, or the beavers will actually undermine the fencing. They did that once. Um, so there is maintenance, but it's like spread out over years instead of it being you know, a, a monthly thing where you're going back there because the beavers are going at it. So, I mean, I agree that putting in boulders also in the and would probably work, but if the town just wants to do something and wants to do something that's effect, you know, effective and is not that expensive, I just would say put a beaver deceiver in there. Sounds great. Um, Don, I see you have your hand raised. So uh, this was a daily chore that I performed in the parks uh, for DCR, um, unclogging dams and culverts each day. It was a, a, a real pain in the neck. Um, the guys that you send out to do it, they got to work in pairs because it's really dangerous work. Uh, like Beth said, the key here is that your flow protection device has to actually be a flow protection device. Um, a designed column of wire that sticks out eight feet into the pond or nine feet into the pond sometimes in order to, for the flow to continue. When uh, Callahan was telling you about maintenance, what he was talking about was unclogging the, the beaver deceiver. You do that with a, a potato fork or you disrupt a corner of the dam with a potato fork. It's not a, I'm going to unclog the whole culvert today chore. It's a, a minor keep the water flowing kind of thing. And like Beth said, if the deceiver is set up the right way, you literally don't have to do maintenance on them very often. It's when they're installed improperly that you end up with a big buildup of debris and sticks there from flow. Um, I, I think she's right in that you could avoid a constant daily chore by just fixing the deceiver first. Yeah. Um, Steve, did you want to make a comment? Yeah, the, um, the, the beavers have done an excellent job of, because there there is that fencing there, at, and they have done a super job of mudding it up because at some points we had it where the water was flowing underneath their dam, a, a little bit, not a lot, but they decided they didn't like that. So now they've got the whole thing mudded up again. 
so that the water can't get through it at all. But they do, but we do have one of those beaver deceiver type things at the Baker Reservoir that's working nice. Yeah, don't you have them somewhere on Town Farm Road too? Yeah, we have. There's two on Town Farm Road, but within days of installing those, the water dried up, and that hasn't been an issue since. Oh, great. Okay. Well, it's a good turn. Yeah, the, the beavers will still block the fencing, but that's kind of the trick. You're tricking them and they think that they're creating something, but the water is still flowing through the pipe. So even if they completely block the outer side of the fencing, like they've done down here at Dudley Pond, um, you would have this 12 inch pipe or whatever coming through the fencing. So the water could just keep flowing and it wouldn't matter that they went and blocked up the whole um, fencing. Oh. There's a good example right off Jettison Road to Steve on Inchesbury, there right along the county road where it's working pretty well. Lois, did you have any comments you wanted to make since you're, this is involving you're in a butter? Well, actually, it sounds like what's going on is, I mean, what you're discussing with the beaver deceiver or the flow device being set in properly sound, sounds reasonable to me. Um, and uh, and my only other thought was, uh, since I've already signed on to Mike Callahan maintaining the flow device at my pond, uh, that something could be coordinated with the town to, like I was suggesting, a, a, a twofer. Um, if he was going to be there anyways, maybe um be attending the the town one you know on the other culvert as well yeah um so, so do, we need to, do we need to make a recommendation that the, the highway department move forward with that well what i was gonna i mean yeah that we can make a recommendation the other question i had was um do we want to make a recommendation about how we would like this to come back to us for review in what form um, of an application? I guess I would suggest it's a sort of an emergency right now <laughs> that maybe we issue an emergency cert and and you know condition it that we'd like to see a beaver deceiver put in there. I mean, I guess it would have to be sort of an agreement beforehand that that's what they're going to do. And then we can include it in the, in the emergency cert, you're allowed to, we're giving you permission to put one in, but they kind of have to propose it. My, yeah, they do. My concern, idea. my concern, and I think that'd be great. And I hope that that'll happen. That's what I think would be the best thing. Um, if they come back, um, if for some reason, this is why I'm asking, because it you know, falls on me to issue the emergency certification. So I guess I'm asking the commission for guidance um, if for some reason that falls through or it's not feasible and the highway department like contacts me and says, you know, we want to just breach the dam again, um, what kind of conditions do we want to have me impose to make sure we don't have what happened last time? Because I think we could all agree it was not ideal. Um, it was unintended, of course, we understand that, but we just want to be proactive and think about it. And I, I would like to ask the commission for some guidance about that. I mean, I think initially they, like Beth said, I think we should make a recommendation that they do the right thing recommended by the people who are expertise in this and not keep doing emergency certification for piecemeal work that isn't solving the problem. Well, what about a, like a recommendation that if, for example, they need to do another breach that it be done by hand. Yes, I, yes, I, 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 I yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And my understanding is that it should be done like over a period of hours, not not just like all at once. Is that? Well, I would suggest over a couple of days. That's a lot of water. Even a couple Thanks, hours Scott. may not do it. Scott, go ahead. Yeah, I. I like the idea of, of um, if we were to receive another request for an emergency that we we limit the amount that we're going to allow it to be lowered 
from where it is, and I don't know what's reasonable, but I think to, you know, if it's building up within two feet of, you know, the, within, um, you know, the road shoulder or whatever that we can establish a level and to take it down over the course of hours with hand tools and then, but that that's the, the emergency action, but I do think that we could we could also um, state that the it's really the long term fix is you know putting in like a Clemson leveler or whatever we want to call it, but um, you know to actually you know lower the water level at a certain fixed elevation, and I think to me the emer just doing emergency actions don't think they're going to get to where we want to be. Um, and I think that is just to address the emergency. But if we want to really solve the problem, then I think it's, you know, um, stating that that's their path forward to solving the problem. Um, do we have a sense of what the right level would be? I don't. Steve, do you have, do a, you sense have a sense of that? Of that? <laughs> the the right level was it wasn't even a pond <laughs> so i'm not sure i mean where it is now see it seems good if we could manage that how far off from the crown of the road do you think is it like two feet below or do you have a sense of that yeah it, it's yeah it's probably it, it's got to be two two and a half feet I to me, to me you know, on projects that I've worked on, usually, and I defer to, of course, Steve is the expert here um, on what is needed to, to protect the road. But traditionally, we've always set like two feet from the crown of the road for an emergency situation. And then, you know, trying to set something permanently a little bit below that. It was also flooding, you know, it's helpful to go look at this. It was flooding sideways and and covering putting a lot of the land on either side of it underwater too when we looked at it right and that's what what should be happening i mean there's you know it's a floodplain in that area it's it's, it's uh, land subject to flooding and there it's a large flat area that can take a lot of water I, I don't know i guess the question is how much does it need to come up where the culverts at risk and the roads at risk cuz the trees can handle it the wetlands can handle it. It's really the road that we're concerned about. Okay. All right. Well, um, let's, uh, I guess we'll wait um, to hear back from the highway department about when they want to do something about it. Do we need I to put a time frame on that? Because, I mean, that's what we did last time is we waited until we needed an emergency. You know, there's rain predicted for the future again. You know, it well, would be nice point. to have a time limited plan. Um, I guess my thought is if it's an emergency, we would still tell them that they need to do it by hand and do it gradually would be the idea. Um, whether, you know, at whatever time they decide they need to do that. Yeah, that's what I would like to be assured that they're going to do it carefully and not risk the washing out. I just what how the dam, the the other dam, the, the man-made stone dam and, and how the water was coming through the face of that dam, I think was really puts stuff at risk um, if it's not done carefully. And I I would just really like some kind of assurance that it that the highway department is going to be careful about it if 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 assurance is give, if, if assurance is uh, available yeah. that, i think that's understood and you know our our concern of course is that we don't want to have any sudden uncontrolled releases because those are not good for wetlands and wildlife habitat that shocks the system and it's um destructive to habitat for things to happen in very dramatic, intense, rapid ways. Um, we got Steve, another hand up. 
Steve, you have your hand raised. Yeah, I do. I, I was just going to say that we won't, we're not planning on doing anything to it, but like it's been mentioned that if it's going to rain, that's the, only, that's when we'll have an issue. Otherwise it's, it's flowing just enough. It's flowing in and it's, it's pretty level. It's maintaining itself right now. Okay, good. All right. Well, that's good. If it's staying the same, that's what we want. Lois, you've got your hand still raised. Did you want to say something else or are you ready to move? Can we move on? Your hand no, still it, that was just a, a whoops. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so we do have the emergency certification. And um, so I'm looking uh, for the commission to ratify it. Um, so it was issued last week. I make, make a motion. motion. Go ahead. <laughs> I make a motion to ratify the emergency cert to breach the dam on Montague Road. Okay. Second. Okay, David. Aye. Font I. Harrington. Aye. 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 And Wilson. Aye. Okay. Um, next, um, another highway department issue um, to review. And um, I just this is the road work over on Dean Brook with the guardrail repairs. And um, what happened was that um, on the 28th, there was a townwide announcement about a road closure and I um, on Pratt Corner Road. And I emailed the town administrator and the highway department to inquire what was going to be done and learned that they were replacing the metal guardrails over Dean Brook. Um, and I expressed some concern about that. And um, over on the 29th, Mary and I um, went and did a site visit. Uh, I think I sent the commission a site visit form with photos. Um, and uh, as a result of that, asked the highway department to install erosion controls, a staked erosion sock um, around where the guardrails were going to be removed and reinstalled. Um, and so um, the work was done on Monday, May 1st, and uh, Mary and I uh, did another site visit that afternoon and, and confirmed that the erosion controls were in place. So, um, and while we were out there on, in, on the first visit, we noticed another area just uh, uphill from Dean Brook where there's a lot of um, sediment washing down from the road that is getting into a wetland. Um, and possibly into Dean Brook. So that was uh, just an area of concern that we observed. Um, there's a, in a, a buried storm drain that drains into that spot. And there was just a lot of sediment that had collected. Um, it looks like maybe there's been some sort of a detention basin in the past that now it's pretty much filled up. So there may have been some more stormwater storage there that just needs some maintenance, I think. So um, I don't know if we want to um, follow up in any way. So this was, you know, I guess the question is, you know, is there any more action we need to take around this? The sound, it sounds like the work was done. They put the erosion control up, the work was done. There wasn't any kind of a huge rain event or anything while the work was being done. So there was no erosion. Um, we may want to just as a group go and do another site visit to look at what you were talking about about the storm water, see if the, you know we could propose some fixes along there to the highway department. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, that's a good idea. Um, and it was, you know, I was really appreciative that the uh, highway department was willing to act so quickly and I think um, send somebody out maybe it was even Steve to go out over the weekend and get erosion controls right. thank you for doing that yeah I agree um, the only thing I would say is that you know the only reason why we learned about this is because there was a townwide phone announcement and if there hadn't been I don't know that we would have known about it until after the fact um, and you know, ultimately, our biggest concern is making sure that erosion controls are going to be used for this kind of work. Um, and I would hope that, you know, 
every time this kind of work is being planned, that there would just be a proactive plan to go out and make sure there's a stockpile of erosion controls to install. And also, you know, come to us or, you know, include us in even just saying what they're going to be doing so we can say something like, oh, erosion control would be a good idea. Yeah. Okay, so any other discussion around this or we... No, okay. All right, well, thank you, Steve. And uh, I guess we can move on to, um, let's see what else we have on the agenda. We're gonna have a short meeting tonight. Um, the first yeah. call request for written comments on the draft watershed plan. So. I've gotten some feedback from people that I incorporated into a document. Um, and I thought, you know, we can I, we can review that tonight before I send it, kind of come up and discuss um, what our comments are, if there's some we wanna keep, maybe some we don't wanna keep. That's on, has everybody had a chance to read it? It was a lot to read. It was Yeah, I'm, I'm about halfway through. And so I'm wondering if, if I can, we can still provide comments. If I get through the second half, can I still provide you some? Or, or are we? When, yeah. when are you thinking of sending the letter? Well, they wanted it by tomorrow. Oh. So, um, <laughs> but I imagine if we give them some feedback, um, you know, if there's something really um, that sticks out and you want me to send it to me, I can pass it on to them because I'm sure it's they're not going to be like Monday morning doing all of it. And I, but my understanding is that um, LWAC has its own set of comments that they're um, going to separately um, provide. So, um, and I had made a suggestion to the FERPOG people that they also reach out to the Wendell Conservation Commission because uh, yeah. a good portion of the watershed is in Wendell actually. So um, it seems like that they should have some input around discussing the health of the watershed. Um, so should I put this up on screen share and we'll go through the comments? Okay. Sure. Thanks. And these, you know, these, they'll, you know, the, it is what it is. Okay. Can you guys see this? Yes. Okay. So started with just, you know, thanking them for it and, commending them on the work because I think it was an excellent report and really informative. And um, I learned a lot. So um, a lot went into it. It was a long project in the making. Um, and then I broke it down and, you know, it's not, I'm sure we could, we could go through this and get more feedback, but I, I don't feel like, you know, we, we don't want to make uh, perfect the enemy of the good here. So there were a few editing comments. Um, one was that um, the winter lake lowering is two feet, not eight feet. There was a mention of it being eight feet. And um, there were a couple of references to roads that I think were incorrect. Shore drive, I believe is parallel to the lake, not perpendicular. And the Laurel drives, um, as far as I know, they may not actually be owned by LWA, but they're man maybe managed by LWA um, and that they should check on that. Um, then the uh, Lake Oyola Conservation Area um, on the map was actually mapping out as Southbrook Conservation Area. So um, just that label. Um, I also, this is just my comment, I guess, that the report seemed to cover certain topics over again. So maybe Beth, you didn't miss anything. <laughs> if you got through the first half, I don't know if anybody else had that impression that it seemed like you know, they would talk about phosphorus loading and then they would come back to it later in a different kind of way. It just seemed like they were trying to make sure people understood what they were getting at, but but I, I totally understand that they did come back to it. I think, and I, yeah, and I think a lot of it was clarification. Yeah, I, they also, you know, I think there's like a template for these plans. And so I think they're following a template. And so they may have just needed to plug information in because it fit in different places 
multiple times. And so I don't know if I just want to com- put a comment about that, 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 you know, maybe, maybe that could be clarified or they could look at it that if there's any adding, I mean, I don't even know if that's really necessary feedback. Should I take this out? No, you can leave it. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. And then uh, I think there was a question about who's doing the E. coli testing that they need to, it was a little unclear in the report. Um, and then- Mir- um, Miriam, DCR yeah. is doing uh, the, the testing now for the, for the lake, for the, for the beach throughout the summer. But the board I, I don't know if LWAC is doing it as well. Right. And the Board of Health may do some testing. So I think it's just that it's a little unclear. Um, maybe uh, they need maybe a they table. <laughs> um, so I just think that was a little unclear. Um, on page 19, there was a list of stakeholders. And I noticed that it didn't include Lake Wyola Association, which struck me. And also Wendell wasn't included. And I thought that it, those two entities really should be included as stakeholders. If that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, on page five, 55, there was a discussion about municipally owned parcels that could be used for BMPs. And I'm not sure those are still all municipally owned. Um, I think that was a reference from a 2007 stormwater plan. And I think that there may have been a land transfer that may mean some of those parcels are now in private ownership and that that should just be clarified. Um, And then 56, uh, there was some discussion about a privately owned yard drain. And um, I just added a comment here, concern that, you know, the yard drain, we approved an order of conditions to disconnect. And I thought rather it would be make sense to just not make specific references to private property for BMP locations because I thought landowners may not appreciate a public report call, you know, suggesting that they need to have their properties be used for stormwater. That maybe um, a better way to do it is just say that you know the stakeholders need to. Um, or should look for ways to acquire land if they don't have land for stormwater BMPs. And BMPs means best management practices. Those are particular kinds of stormwater structures like detention basins or vegetated swales or rain gardens, things like that. Um, And then there was a, again, under recommendations, there was a recommendation for a comprehensive roadway evaluation, but it was a little confusing because the roads being identified were all private roads. And it wasn't really clear to me, like, well, who would do that? And um, what would that look like? And again, if those are privately owned roads by LWA and they're not even listed as a stakeholder, in the report, it just felt a little complicated to me and like that perhaps, you know, there needed to be some thought about that. What do you guys think? Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. fine. They, they need to realize that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I think that sometimes um, there's a, and I wondered about this, whether there was a tendency to kind of lump LWA and LWAC into the same category and sort of view LWAC as being an extension of LWA, which of course it's not. And so I just think like make, being clear about that um, would be useful. Um, and then additional information that might be helpful. Um, so this was Mary's comment that the water quality monitoring around the lake is not well coordinated and communicated that different stakeholders do different kinds of testing and there's no kind of centralized location where the public can access that information in under in an understandable format. Um, similarly, water levels in the lake are monitored by the town but are not reported to the public. It would be helpful if one stakeholder could collect all the data and develop some website where information could be accessed. What's the recommendation? Make sense? Mm-hmm. Uh, wildlife habitat evaluation wasn't referenced in the report, the one that was done by the town. And um, 
So the suggestion was that, you know, it might be useful information in there because there was some discussion about um, a set of, you know, evidence of drawdown um, on sediment loading. Um, so that was one piece of information that just wasn't included. Um, and then again, the, com the, com the comment about Wendell Conservation Commission might should be solicited for input regarding Fisk Brook and Fisk Bond. Um, it appeared, uh, it, it does not appear like they accompanied FERCOG on the site visit in 2022. Another joint visit with all the relevant stakeholders might be a good idea. Um, Lake Wyola is priority habitat since 2021. That wasn't in the report. Um, and then here's sort of some discussion. I don't even know, I don't know this. This is the discussion about LWA. Um, members, this is from Mary. Um, so membership is voluntary. Um, membership is less than 50% of the property owners around the lake. Um, Non-LWA members do not receive all the same communications that are sent to LWA members. So future planning should include both LWA and non-LWA landowners and residents, two different things because you could be a resident who's renting, who's not a landowner, um, including uh, residents who rent. And at present, there's no systematic channel of communication that reaches all residents and landowners in the Lake Wayola district. Um, one of the major challenges to the watershed is the fact that the roads around the lake are privately owned the commission is aware that there are resident complaints about insufficient private road repair and maintenance. LWA has told the commission that they lack the funds to do all the necessary work. Uh, more information about their priorities and planning would be helpful. Um, some of the current maintenance is conducted by individual residents around the lake, an approach that is inconsistent and unsustainable. Local residents have asked for a better maintenance plan and assistance for residents who are unable to perform the maintenance functions on their own. I, some of this isn't really about watershed stuff. It's it's I don't know how much we want to get into this. That's a question I have. I, I think, think should... it's in, I think the comments are important for people. I don't from from the report, I don't get the impression, and this is a lot of people, they don't understand what LWA is. LWA will do this, LW, and they don't understand that. LWA is only is less than half the residents that actually live here. So I, I mean, I just think it's whether they put it in or not. It's a, I think they need to understand the function of the LWA. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. <clears throat> um, any more comment on this, or more that we need to have in this paragraph? Does this look all right, Mary? Yeah. No, I think I think that covers the major points. Okay. Good. Um, one of the comments was a total percentage of impervious cover for the whole watershed may not be as meaningful at the micro watershed level on the west side of the lake. The density of impervious cover is greater and is increasing as homes are updated for year round use, plus slopes contribute to runoff issues because they were looking at, they took this percentage of how much impervious cover there was for the whole watershed, which is, you know, like hundreds of acres. And so, yeah, it looks like there's very little impervious cover, but when you actually get down to the neighborhood level in those particular zones, it's a different story. There's much more dense development. Um, and then a couple comments about things that we deal with. So when the commission reviews projects, it looks to ensure that net decreases in pervious surfaces and changes in stormwater runoff patterns are addressed, but we have no jurisdiction outside the 100 foot buffer zone. So development outside of jurisdictional areas is something that we don't regulate. I just think it's an important point to make. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Um, concerns about beaver management at the lake is multifaceted. Some residents and town officials have expressed concern about uh, beaver related risks such as dam failure and culvert blockages. Some have suggested beaver populations add to stormwater resilience more study is needed as well as a coordinated beaver management plan. That's something we've been advocating for. So I thought I'd put a plug in there for that. Is that all right? Um, getting some updated information about the condition of Fisk Pond Dam, including the success of the flow protection device that's been installed there from the Wendell Conservation Commission would be useful. 
Um, more information about development changes and recreational use patterns. Um, we've received anecdotal reports of increased turbidity and bank erosion being caused by recreational wake boats and other kinds of motor boats. Wave action from boats would contribute possibly to sediments migrating. Uh, Shoot Spray has a bylaw that regulates speed but not horsepower on the lake and due to staffing and budget issues, enforcement is probably very challenging. Um, the current speed limit on of 100, blah, blah. the current limit on speed within 150 feet of the shore may be inadequate in the case of wake boats. Um, so just more studies needed. Does that make sense? Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we received, um, part of the context for this is that um, somebody recently discussed a dredging project with us and talked about how um, their property, the, the, the lake around their property has been silting up and they called attention to the effect of wave action from motorboats and wake boats. So that's kind of partially where that's coming from. Um, we've received anecdotal information suggesting that land use is changing around the lake with an increase in year-round residents and conversions of cottages. As far as we know, there are no good statistics on this, although the 2004 master plan discussed it. Uh, we've reviewed several projects in just the past three years that involved cottages being converted to year-round residences that were larger with larger impervious footprints. Um, Many homeowners have properties that have become bermed either intentionally or due to road erosion. While we endeavor um, to ensure that there are no adverse impacts on the lake from development, there's undoubtedly some cumulative impact that may be difficult to quantify. I don't know if we want to say more study is needed. <laughs> no, I don't think, they, I think they can assume okay. that. So this is a little redundant, but here again about the berming, um, changing stormwater pot. Um, and that some of the observed berms appear to be within the footprint of privately owned dirt roads, leading to a question whether LWA might be able to play a role um, in ensuring that alterations do not contribute to sediment releases. Um, we often find these alterations after the fact, and if they're outside of our jurisdictional resource areas, we have a limited role to play. I'm just kind of looking at it from our perspective. Right. Um, and then comments about, are, are you guys, are there, is there any more that you, that we've missed, Beth, since you didn't get a chance to give me any written comments? Um, I guess in the, you know, the first half that I read, one of my big comments is, so I've been involved in writing these for the Fort River and for the Mill River. And in both cases, they had large sort of brainstorming sessions from all the stakeholders. They had, you know, and I and I almost felt like that was required in the process, but maybe it's not required. So, like you said, this is a template from DEP, and DEP. Um, well, especially if you want to get a three nineteen grant with EPA, you have to do one of these. Like one of these has to exist for the watershed that you want to get a three nineteen grant for. So often, they will help you put one of these together when you apply for one of those grants. Um, but in both those cases, like, you know, it was like, a, they had these large meetings where there was maybe like, you know, 20 people all sort of just all the stakeholders getting together and saying what they would like to see in this plan and talking about the watershed. And um, I don't know, I just feel like this was written with kind of a limited amount of input. And um, I don't know, I don't really know what the requirements are. Like, where are they actually required to hold a stakeholder meeting to 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 get everybody's or having stakeholders do it this way and like review and provide comments is acceptable. It might totally be acceptable. I don't know. Um, that's just the way I had seen it done before. And I just thought it was a nice way to include everybody and then really get lots of comments um, to make it a better document. That's my comment. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, that maybe that's a question we could ask them when we have a public meeting with them. Um, so I think there's a plan to have a public meeting um, 
and with uh, LWAC and the select board and the CONCOM and maybe maybe there'll be you know, some other stakeholders at that meeting as well as the public. So um, maybe that's a time to ask or maybe that's what, what that's gonna be. I don't know, maybe that'll be a time for more discussion. Maybe this is just kind of, they're getting the draft out to us and it's a work in progress. I, I don't really know. Um, I saw Mark was on the call. Is he still there? Do you know? <laughs> Mark Rivers? Yeah, I'm Mark here. Hi. Do you have an answer about that, about the process? Um, well, they took a lot of uh, historical documents and studies that were you know, already published and put them together. Uh, so that's what, and, and that's largely what this contains. And I do believe there's uh, a plan to have other stakeholders involved in this discussion. It just started off with just a CONCOM and a, a sort of a narrowly defined group. Okay. But um, when we have this we're public meeting, they're talking about in June, having one or more public meetings would, is the idea being that the draft will still be open for revision at that point? Um, it's my understanding that the draft is absolutely open for revision at that point. Okay. So Beth, if you have more comments, you have time to get them. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah. Um, and then um, a couple of thoughts about causes of impairment and pollution sources. So there's this kind of confusing discussion about total phosphorus and phosphorus loading. Um, the analysis just seemed confusing to me. Um, if the data does not support the existence of significant phosphorus loading, then it's unclear why this is being prioritized or how a reduction in total phosphorus can be achieved. Um, the last data from 2014 showed it was below the prevention goal. So some clarification on this would be helpful to the reader. Given that the forest is estimated to be the primary source of phosphorus, it's unclear what action steps can and should follow from this analysis. Is more data needed to assess this issue? That was my comment. Thank yeah, you. I think I think that's that was definitely one of my comments too. Was sort of that it's, it seems to be it was you know listed historically, but now the newer data has really shown that it's not an issue. But then. It seemed like the EPA's uh, response was, well, we see that it's lower, but we still want to have some kind of a, a, pre a preventative goal. You know, they don't, they don't want to let go. They want to still have it sort of listed on the integrated list with something, um, which is okay. But then, yeah, then the, I, I, did I see in there somewhere that the goal was almost to get it down to nothing? I well, can't yeah, they were sort of saying maybe, ha I think they may have said decrease it by 50%. And I'm thinking like, is that even feasible without, you know, yeah. this is a highly developed area. It's surrounded by forest. And, you know, that may be not achievable. <laughs> maybe the right. better approach is to say, keep it below that 15. Um, what is it? Yeah. What, is, what is the, the mu? G, it's is it milligrams? That's my my micrograms, micrograms, micrograms per liter. Thank you, micrograms per liter. So you know that may. I wonder if that makes more sense. I mean, what are we going to do? Cut down all the trees to get rid of the phosphorus? I don't know. Yeah, um, it's a question. I think that's a good question. Good question. Okay. And then um, this was another concern: was that the the plan references at least two known stormwater outfalls on the west side of the lake that drain directly into the lake. I was only aware of the location of one that we've seen on site visits. And, um, you know, we hear rumors that there are more of them. They're not mapped. Um, at least one of these we know is collecting stormwater from Locks Pond Road and directing that stormwater directly down past um, 14 Lake Drive, you may recall the intermittent stream kind of channel and that then pipes right into the lake. So um, my suggestion was that a, a survey and perhaps mapping these um, outfalls and where their inlets are would be helpful information um, and maybe 
looking for um, whether there's some strategies for disconnecting them, either disconnecting them or um, pre-treating them. Um, mm -hmm. So that um, sediment has some treatment before it gets piped right into the lake. Yep, definitely. Or even uh, in, you know, uh, upgrading them too to be BMPs yeah, yeah. that have yes. treatment within them. So I know um, Penny is on the call, and and maybe Mark's still there. Are you aware of more of these besides the two that are on the? mentioned in the report. Somebody have their hand, Mark or Penny? Uh, I recall from the last drawdown, which was many years ago now, that there were a number and they were not mapped at that time. Um, this is Mark here, I, I agree there's, um, there is a there is a number of of uh, sort of uh, there's no there are a number of paths that are on Locks Pond Road that are directed to the lake that are not mapped. I think um, that would be really helpful to get them mapped in the future, so that we could then start looking at if any of them are contributing to sedimentation, and you know. Um, you know, it's complicated, but knowing what's there seems important. So anyway, so that's in there as a, as a mm -hmm. recommendation. And then action plans, um, you know, this is just information. The commission advocates for vegetated buffer strips around the lake, um, but many residents continue to landscape with turf lawns and little plant diversity, a community education program perhaps with some pilot projects would be helpful to showcase lake friendly landscaping and, and maybe increase homeowner interest. Um, does that sound good to you guys? Mm -hmm. um, the stormwater, the 2007 DCR stormwater plan has a number of recommended BMPs and action steps that have never been uh, fully adopted and are still relevant. And we'd recommend that the town and other stakeholders uh, revisit this and look for um, low hanging fruit. That is clear action steps that maybe could be developed in the short run while larger scale solutions are explored. It's sort of the idea of being, you know, um, start doing something, <laughs> even if it's that being doing it piecemeal, just so that things are moving along in a better direction, I guess is my thought. Mm -hmm. And, and this is the place to list all those things because this is the document that helps you get grants. You know, it's not like we're saying, we're listing these things because this is what we want the town to do and use town funds. It's more like this kind of a plan. You write it, you say what your dreams are, and yeah. then you go apply for grants. Right. It's really helping the town, you know. Yeah. Um, and then... Um, did someone say something? I said good point that she made. Yeah. Um, and then in the report, I really liked um, the suggestions around a fluvial geomorphic study and maybe a, a hydrologic and hydraulic study. Um, so I would just, I, I, maybe I could say this differently, but do we want to say the commission would support those things? I think that, you know, those would be really useful. In particularly understanding, my understanding was understanding um, what's going on with Fisk Brook and maybe sedimentation patterns from Fisk Brook and that watershed. That these would be studies that would help us understand some of the concerns about sedimentation. Or you can just say that the CONCOM suggests that these studies be done, that grants get applied to do them. How about that? I'll just be redundant. Okay. And then um, a suggestion here about maybe a comprehensive beaver management plan for the watershed. Sure. 
just, you know, we're dreaming, Beth. We're dreaming. Right? So that's what I'm saying. Throw it all in. Throw it, all in. Throw it all in, right? You, you know, there's there's two people in town that have actually written uh, a comprehensive beaver management study, myself and Paul Lyons. Yeah. I, and I would think that they would consult with at least Paul Lyons uh, to, to get his, uh, his take on, you know, long-term beaver management. I, I think he, you know, would be saying a lot of things that Callahan would be saying about uh, the feasibility of trapping as a management tool or not trapping as a management tool. But, uh, you know, I, I really feel like they should consult an expert on that. Scott Campbell, the engineer at DCR, who originally wrote that stormwater management plan, said exactly the same thing back in 2007, 2008, that they should be consulting Paul Lyons about the beaver management. So, you know. Communities um, have gotten grants to develop a municipal beaver management plan. And um, they're really interesting documents that sort of identify all the hot spots and then strategies for addressing them um, for the various hot spots. So um, we have lots of them, lots of hot spots. <laughs> lots all of right. beavers. Okay. Um, dredging to address sedimentation for Fisk Brook. Um, there's a comment, I don't know how to say this. It seemed, it just struck me that, you know, the dredging is kind of addressing the effect, but not the root cause of sedimentation. Um, and that maybe it's only a temporary solution since the sedimentation in that location may also be primarily due to natural causes. So um, I'm just wondering about making a recommendation to prioritize solutions that are more prevention oriented and focus on human made impacts rather than just trying to kind of curb natural forces, but looking at, um, you know, putting energy and efforts toward, you know, development effects. And may, maybe it could be said better. I don't know how to say it. <laughs> maybe we could wordsmith this a little bit. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think it's fine like it is. Hmm. You know, again, it's something for them to look at. Because when they're sort of talking about the idea of dredging being uh, a way to create kind of more volume in North Cove for storing uh, stormwater, and that that's being decreased because of sedimentation, which makes sense. And I understand that historically there's been uh, dredging like every 20 years um, to maintain that cove like. Um, configuration. So in some ways, what's happening is nature's just reverting back to a stream bed. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I feel comfortable saying, I guess, sort of like, in addition to including in this document, um, dredging the, the, the North Cove, um, in addition to that, the Conservation Commission is is would be interested in a project that looks at its sources, you know, the, the source of the sedimentation and um, addresses some solutions to the, the actual source of that, you know? Oh, well, you're so, getting heavy. So in the dredging sedimentation, um, the SCC supports, what, say that again? Uh, a study into the, um, the sources of the sedimentation. That doesn't sound very good, but I guess. Well, that's right. So as, um, yeah. as well as uh, prioritizing um, human-made impacts. Human or, you know, I, um, priori prioritizing, um, I guess what I'm thinking about is like, you know, the stormwater issues for that we're discussing that are um legion here yeah and I, I guess that's fine i just the prioritizing part i think is what okay. i not so comfortable yeah. saying because we're kind of like poo-pooing their project no, which right. is, no we don't want to do that you know and, and, and i think that project's probably really important to certain people and they've been wanting yeah. to do it for a while so i i like the words in addition to you yeah. know in addition to the project of dredging the the, yeah. the north cove because that's important to some people 
you know, we would like to also see studies into the sources of sedimentation, including uh, stormwater impacts on dirt roads, and then also, I guess, what's up upstream of um, North Cove up there, because we don't really understand where that's all coming from. And what? And what? Oh, sorry. I'm sorry <laughs> and upstream. upstream. The source of sedimentation upstream of North Cove. Is that what it's called? North Cove? Um, that's what they call it, but we're talking about Fisk Brook. So we're talking about Fisk Brook. Yep. Okay, that sounds good. Yeah. Uh, and then what? Oh, go on. I'm sorry. Um, there, there already has been a study on the source of sedimentation in the North Cove, um, and um, uh, and and it's a pretty detailed stu uh, study. That I think it's on uh, um, the our website already, the LWA website. And so, uh, NRCS or the one that was done in 1995. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah, I think it was 95. You might be right. Yeah, but it, it really talked about the the beaver dams and the, the effects of of uh, of a breakage of beaver dams causing a lot of silt coming into the lake at that time. Yeah. And and one of my comments for the on um, you know on the study is is that is we um, we should be looking at you know, uh, upstream mitigation to prevent it from happening again, which I think is kind of what you're saying. But there, yeah, there was is... there was there actually property destruction from the flooding in the '90s that those reports referenced? Uh, not property destruction, but but silt, but but two or three feet of silt coming into the lake and mm -hmm. settling in North Cove. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, one of my comments on this. Uh, uh, and on this report is that we really should be looking at CONCOM's ability to, to deal with an emergency situation so that uh, if it happens again, you know, can we, can CONCOM direct corrective action, you know, in, in an emergency situation, well, be, you know, without going through months and months of, of, uh, of DCR and EPA approval. Well, um, what do you mean? Like, what kind of emergency action? Right. When this happened originally, yeah, uh, we had, it was a it was a couple of microbursts that caused the beaver dams to break, according to this report, and uh, created a lot of sediment coming into the lake. At that point, nobody at that time nobody did anything. It was just like, oh, there's a lot of sediment now coming in. The the, the North Coast filled in. But what is our, what is the town's, what is uh, CONCOM's ability to react in an emergency situation and rectify the situation? And back then, nobody dealt with it. You know, um, you know if today, if, today if, um, if three feet of silt came into the, the, the North Cove, what is, our, what is our reaction to that? And can does it, can can and is there the, the ability to to take care of it in an emergency situation and restore it to its original condition condition? And I don't think we understand that. I don't know if you could do a restoration under an emergency certification. Um, See, I think you can. I think you can do that. Yeah. What do you think, uh, Beth? Well. To be an emergency, it has to be a, a, a threat to uh, human health or, you know, it has to be a real threat. I can't, the silt would come in and sure, it's a damage to a resource area um, and it's ruining a recreational area that people are using. I wouldn't call it a, an emergency unless it, there's a real, you know, threat to, to human health. but um you know you certainly can basically plan a project to fix it pretty quickly if that's what people want to do you know it, it has to would have to go through permitting and that kind of thing but um you'd have to you could definitely probably get a consultant involved and in everything to to plan something but you can restore the area so that was my yeah, so that was my comment is to understand the process 
so that if it happens again, we can address it quickly as opposed to waiting 20 years later. Yeah. Yeah, I think 20 that, years is a long time. <laughs> I think like in terms of like, like what we can do, if, for example, if somebody does something intentionally or even maybe accidentally, but it's human action that leads to, let's say, contamination of a wetland, then, you know, there could be an enforcement action that requires a restoration, but that's very different than a natural event um, that may be an extreme natural event that couldn't be easily predicted. And, you know, I don't know what, um, you know, it sounds like some of the concerns are about preventing um, like a catastrophic uh, release of uh, beaver dams. And so my understanding is up at Fisk Pond now, they do have a flow protection device that wasn't there in the 90s. So hopefully if that was an area of concern that the flow protection device would keep water moving. Um, and I, I, I don't know, I think that's where we need kind of some data about what the risks are now. I mean, I understand there were some concerns back in the nineties and some recommendations, but I think we kind of, it just strikes me that maybe a new look at this would be useful. Um, Mark here, I, to I totally agree. Um, and in addition, there's not only one beaver dam at, the, at Fisk Brook, but there's a number of beaver, beaver dams at Fisk Brook. And so the question is, if the first one breaks, what happens to the remaining three or four dams? Do, uh, do they break or do they, and, or do they uh, absorb some of the flow? And so this is a study that need, that really needs to be done to understand mm -hmm. um, the impacts of, uh, of, a, of a, a, a rain event that's either five to, you know, a, a two-year event, which is a five-inch rainstorm, or a 10-year event, which is 11-year, 11 11-inch uh, 11 rainstorm. And, and what happens when we get that, if we get that? Yeah. Uh, so there was a... There was a study that's already that's looked at the sedimentation from Fiskbrook. Did it look at all at um, at the Beaver Dam situation and sort of these risks? Uh, that study, which was done you know, a number of years ago, maybe at least ten years ago, and I don't know the exact date, uh, but it, it just said that the the sediment coming into the lake was as a result of a microburst on Fiskbrook or in that area. And, and Hurricane, I think it was Bertha, um, and um, that the, the, the beaver dams broke open because of the mm -hmm. rainstorm, and all of a sudden there's a, a tremendous amount of water coming into the lake and silt. So it wasn't a study; it was a it was a it was a study that said this is what happened, and, and this is what caused the sediment coming into the lake. Mm -hmm. And so I'm say, saying that is. We need something that's a, you know that to be to try to be a little more proactive first to if it happens again, which it will, what do we do about it? You know, what's that's the, a, what's you say, the that plan? makes me think of um, MVP money, the um, municipal uh, vulnerability preparedness, municipal vulnerability preparedness fund, you know, um, because that money is supposed to go towards sort of preparing um, the town for climate change and you know higher amounts of rain that then can cause some sort of a catastrophic event like what you're talking about. Um, so potentially using MVP funds to do some kind of a study of that that whole drainage there and, and see if there is a real risk. Um, well, my so. understanding was that some of the the um, the uh, excuse me, the fluvial geomorphic study and the hydraulic um, and hydrologic studies would provide some insight into that, that would be then actionable for maybe grant applications um, for future. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe one option might be that as a result of this um, watershed plan that then there could be they could get these um, studies funded through MVP. Yeah. 
Now, just so you understand, my perspective is that uh, is that what we really also need to understand is what's the plan? What's the action plan? Should this happen next year? Mm-hmm. What you know, what does what can Concom do? What can the town do on an emergency basis to address it, um, independent of a plan that says, "Oh, this may happen." Let's go on the assumption that it's that it will happen, and what are we going to do when it does happen again? As opposed to t- ten years ago or fifteen years ago, where nobody did anything. Well, what would be the actions? I mean, I'm trying to imagine. I mean, I think there's kind of preventative actions, and preventative steps, and then like, what do you do in the middle of an emergency? And then what do you do f- after? What are your thoughts? Would be even options for actions? I'm trying to envision this for that particular area. Well, for certain, certainly preventive maintenance would be to, to do an, an upstream, you know, settlement pond to co- co- collect stuff. So on the other side of the, that the, um, what's that called? The, the culvert up there where you have the road um, to, to, you know, is there something that can be done to collect sediment before it hits the lake? And then certainly the next action is it, 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 it if we have another foot of sediment or two feet of sediment that comes into the North Cove, you know, do we have to wait, you know, two years for approvals for you know, and, and permits to to take to address it to to, dredge, to restore it back to its original condition? Or um, uh, well, you know, I, it would probably. I mean, that's a big cove. I would imagine that it would meet the threshold where Army Corps would need to get involved. That you need to get a um, a state permit as well as a local permit for it. Okay. Yes. It was a hundred. What's the threshold? Um, somebody remind me for where I, Army Corps permits are needed for dredging. On the wolf, uh, fishable. Sure. Okay. Is it current flowing boats oh, can what? flow on it? That kind of. No, there's a there's a there's a yeah. threshold of how many cubic feet of material that you remove or cubic yards and if you're over that threshold it was i believe it was 99 either cubic yards or cubic feet i think it might be cubic yards and um because i sort of have this memory of mark stinson saying that they get a lot of dredging applications for 99 cubic yards <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> because if it's 100 then you need an army corps permit so 99 is sort of that golden number <laughs> this mm-hmm. might be, that making the, sense the, the department yeah. of uh, ecological restoration which is a fairly new state agency has a whole group of people that are working on these problems exactly uh, what uh, mark was talking about sediment traps downstream of uh, uh known beaver ponds that have been there for a long time um those usually require special permitting through Corps of Engineers. Yeah, I just don't know. I, I, I don't, can't have an answer for you, but you know, I think that you're asking whether there could be an expedited emergency certification for a dredging restoration project. And um, I, I don't well, have an answer for that. Let me interrupt here, I'm sorry. Uh, but my, um, what I'm suggesting is that we understand the process of what happens if this happens, uh-huh. and so that we're not, you know, trying to figure it out on the fly, right? So yeah. have an emergency action plan for for Lake Wyola kind of thing. Just have it all spelled out as to what permits would be necessary, how long they would take to get them, what kind of funding would be needed. Um, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that sounds to me like an emergency action plan, and and. Again, like this document we're doing right now, we can make that suggestion. We suggest somebody puts together an emergency action plan, and then you could list a few things happening at the lake that could happen. Um, and then with it being in this document, then somebody could take this document and apply for MVP funds and say, so you know, what, in this document. What, um, what was it between what permits are needed, what funding, and uh, what what was timing the... maybe like schedule timing okay and i mean i i can write that up as another recommendation what um besides sedimentation is there another any other emergency actions that we might want to 
include in this? He well, he mentioned like if, if something like that happens with that fisk, and then say the culvert under the road gets blown out or something like that, that becomes more of a bigger emergency, I suppose. That actually hits the category of emergency. <laughs> yeah. um, but just flood damage in general. Right. Flood damage to property as well, I would imagine. Yeah. Um, to private property, not just municipal property. I think the culvert um, has been replaced in some of those, that, those storm events back in the 90s. I don't think that culvert is that old. Do anybody remember when that, I, I was looking through some files and I saw the permits for that culvert replacement, but I don't remember offhand when it was. It's my understanding that the culvert was in place at that time. Oh, it was, so it was, yes. they were there. And it's now falling apart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the box, the concrete isn't, it's just the um, the head, the head walls are in need of a repair, right? Because we just did an emergency certification. So it's, right. yeah. Okay, um, well, I can write that up as another recommendation. I'm happy to do that. Um, and then the other one last thing, which I, I just took it off screen share was just, the, there were some tables where they had action steps and it, it um, I don't know if it makes sense to kind of break it down more by responsible parties rather than saying, you know, it just seemed like it was listing all the responsible parties for each action step. So it didn't feel like it was providing a lot of clarity. I don't know if that's useful or not. Um, well, that, it's always good to comment on if you felt something wasn't clear enough. Yeah. Oh, and I, and I think you need to understand there's a, you know, a lot of this relates to private roads, which the town of Shutesbury has, has, there's different opinions as to what to do and who's responsible. So it, it should, it does need to be clarified, I think. Yeah. Right. But if it, to say, you know, I guess I was thinking like, there's some action steps that involve town roads that the town could, and you know, maybe should be seeking grant money to address. And then there's separate issues for the private roads and, and what their funding streams would be and what you know they would be eligible for in terms of grants. And I think that you know breaking that down by public versus private might be useful. Um, and also private landowners, like people, things that pe pe people can do on their properties with landscaping or with their own development projects. Um, okay. Well, that was a great discussion. I think we should move on. That was that took a long time, but thank you, everybody, and thank you, Mark um, and Don, for contributing. Um, looking for my agenda to see where we're done for tonight. Hang on one sec. I lost my agenda. Here it is. Oop. One more sec. It's not showing up. We, if somebody else can see their agenda, pull it up. Well, I'm looking for my agenda. Oh, here it is. Okay. Um, so a last thing I think we didn't cover. Oh, we have a couple more things to cover. Geez, we're not done. Uh, we had minutes to approve from April 13th. We didn't have a quorum. We don't have the minutes ready for um, April 27th. And we've got some other older minutes that I'm responsible for that I am behind on. So I apologize for that. I will try to take care of that in my free time. Um, but anyway, um, should we consider the minutes? Sure. Somebody want to make a motion? For which meeting? April 13th. Okay, I missed that one. So I have to abstain. I think it was Mary and Beth and I were there. Or mm -hmm. is that right? Who was on the meeting? I don't have them open. Yeah, I think so. You have on the agenda to review draft minutes from 427. Was that the yeah. one we couldn't vote on because we didn't have quorum? We didn't have a quorum. I'm sorry. Um, April 27th, are, we're passing over because they're not ready. Um, okay. I finished reviewing them. Um, the uh, Carrie review, got me a draft. I just haven't had time to look at them. So April 13th is what I'm suggesting we review. But... Okay. I did not put it on the agenda, then maybe we should hold off. Yeah, I was gonna say, I don't remember seeing those. So I think we should 
put it off to the next they meeting. Were sent, they were sent out. Okay, well, we'll table that then. Um, site visit, we need to do some scheduling. We have quite a few site visits that we need to take care of um, that are starting to pile up. So things that we have to take care of in May, um, we need to do a site visit at 678 Pratt Corner Road that uh, restoration, where there's supposed to be a, a spring site visit. Um, so the landowner said we can do it midweek if that works. Um, if you guys can give me a couple dates, I'll, I'll try to get it scheduled. Um, can we can we do it in, uh, next week before the lot 032? We could do it. That would be fine. Okay. So we'll do it on, on May 25th. Great. Um, then we've got the lot 032 site visit on the, I'm not, not the 25th, excuse me, the 24th before um, we've got the lot 032 site visit already scheduled for 530. Um, I'm waiting to get an arborist report for a tree removal request for 13 Cove Row. And I guess we should just hold off on that one until we get the arborist report. Um, then there is a ground mounted solar project at 530 West Pelham Road that uh, we weren't able to get scheduled this week. So I'm wanting to see if we can get out there next week since um, this has been pending for a couple of weeks. Um, are there any days when folks would be available during midweek? I'm pretty much available. I don't have my calendar in front of me. So I, I don't think I have stuff. I don't have I think I think I'm pretty open to. Um looks like maybe I could do either Monday or Wednesday. So um I'll let you guys know, but see if I can come yeah. up with the time. And then there's also a building permit at Two Lakeview Road. Maybe I'll try to schedule that at the same time. It's for a garage. It's across the road from the river. I think I don't think it's going to be in riverfront area. I don't know if there's any resource areas, but um, I don't think it's riverfront area. Um, and what else? I think that's it. I feel like Can I just get a clarification. Yes. In lot 032. 5.30, what is the date? May 24th, Wednesday. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right, so that's settled. And what else do we need to do? Um, we were going to get some updates and planning for the um, our bylaw regulation review it was on the agenda. Um, so, oh, oh, here's another issue. Um, I missed, I'm sorry, West Quabbin Woodland Conservation Area updates. So there is a warrant article on a town meeting warrant uh, in order to get the $5,000 reassigned for the parking lot construction because there was a, a little bit of a hiccup in the way the warrant article was written last year. And so um, they're going to resubmit it for the $5,000 of CPA funds. Um, the conservation restriction document is still pending with the state. So the final local signatures um, are not, um, have not been issued. And so it can't be recorded yet. Um, the next step in all of this um, is to start thinking a little bit about where the parking lot would go and what kind of trail development we might want to um, consider. And I had some emails with um, Stuart, whose last name I cannot remember, who is the baseline um, surveyor working for Kestrel, who did the baseline um, report. And he lives on Baker Road um, and has, knows this property really well and said he would be happy to take us on a site visit to take a look at some suggestions around trail development and a location for parking lot. Okay, great. Um, so, great. Um, I'm thinking that could be a weekend site visit. Yeah. Maybe in June. 
Yep. Sure. That'd be great. Um, I'm also thinking that sometime this summer, when we have time, we should plan another site visit to Southbrook Conservation Area. Um, just I would love to go there again. Just take a look at how things are looking and if there's any um, maintenance that's needed on the trails. So um, maybe maybe June, if we can do two site visits like that, that might be a nice thing to do. That would be um, really fun. Is there any chance Liam could join us? I don't know if he'd want to come. Sure, if you ask. Um, so we have a couple of other notices of intent coming in just as an FYI. We received a notice of intent today from DCR for a bridge replacement in DCR land um, over Camel Brook. And this uh, bridge, there, uh, the Conservation Commission issued a determination of applicability in 2017 for like, um, looks like kind of a temporary bridge structure um, that wasn't uh, replacing the abutments, but now they're doing a full reconstruction of this over the stream. So it has to be a notice of intent. And so we'll need to set up, a, we'll do the hearing sometime in June, probably would be first meeting in June. And so I should put that on my list. That's another site visit that we need to set up. Um, and um, that probably will end up having to be during the week because I imagine we'll need to meet with the DCR um, staff on that. Um, it doesn't look like it's a very long hike to get to it, but it's not on the road. You have to hike in. Um, okay. So other um, issues that we were gonna discuss tonight was just an update on where we're at with the bylaw regulation review process and maybe do a little time planning. So the draft is almost completed. Um, I just got a set of feedback from our peer reviewer, Patrick Garner, that I'm going to incorporate into the draft. Um, and hopefully my, I don't know if this is feasible, but I'm hoping that, um, the draft will be ready to present to the commission and to the public next for our next meeting on May 25th. That would be awesome. Um, and then the plan would be that we would schedule, we would um, plan some public hearings. So one of the questions is how many public hearings we would do them in June. So I think two weeks notice is sufficient usually for these things. Um, and but what are your thoughts? Should we have one or two meetings? There are public hearings. I would say we maybe plan for two and see how the first one goes, see if we get a lot of public interest and a lot of, you know, public comments. It, you know, basically you want to just provide enough time so that anyone from the public who wants to comment can. So if we have one and we only get you know, three people and they make all their comments, then I guess we're done. <laughs> That's how I we see it. I, I just, I can't, you know, yeah. figure how, how many people would come. Yeah. I don't know. So well, uh, our, meeting, sense. our meetings are right now scheduled for June 8th and the 22nd. So one of my questions is, um, do you want to schedule it for June 8th? And do you want to consider a separate meeting? Oh, 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 you know what? I remember now why I was going to ask this. So the issue is that um, Janice Stone is not available on Tuesdays, um, on Thursdays, because she has another, uh, she works for a commission and they meet on the same schedule that we do. So um, the question I had was whether the commission would be willing to schedule the public hearing on a Wednesday so that Janice, who's been working on these um, regulations, could be present. That feels important to me. So are we going to get, get this to look at, I think May 25th is kind of quick if, we, if it's not ready for us. We haven't looked at the final draft ourselves yet. Uh, do uh, we really want to take that to the public before we've had a chance to review it and well, see we if would we agree meet, with everything? We would, we would discuss it as a commission on the 25th. Um, and I guess we could decide we don't have to post the public hearing. I'm just wanting to like give people heads ups and, and especially with Patrick Garner's schedule to make sure what his availability is. So um, if we get the, the drafts to you guys uh, by May 20, before May 25th, ideally, 
so that we could discuss it at our May 25th meeting, then we can make a decision of whether we feel like we're ready um, to do a public hearing on the 8th. And I, I think we can make revisions. We don't have to have our final, final draft. Um, there, there, I'm guessing there will be revisions um, based on the public hearing process. And you know, once uh, you've had an opportunity to review the drafts. Does that sound okay? Yes. I think we do want to make sure that commission members have enough time, you know, all of us to to really look at it. Um, well, what so I guess, how, how soon? So here's a, let's think about this. What if we were, you know, let's shoot for the, the commissioners are going to get it by May 25th and we can have a preliminary discussion if we want to, or if people aren't ready, that's fine. And, uh, what if we were to shoot for having a public hearing on June 14th um, or June 28th? Uh, the only reason why I'm concerned about it, honestly, and I, I'm not in a hurry, except that we've been told that the funds that have been allocated for our peer reviewer um, have to be spent by July 1st or those funds will be clawed back and won't be available. So if we want to have him present at a public hearing and the public hearing needs to be in July, then um, we would have to decide if we were going to, how we were going to pay for his time. We wanted to use funds from our bylaw fee fund. We can't use our Notice of Intent Wetlands Protection Act fund for this because this is bylaw work. There are some funds in the bylaw fund that we could use. So that's really the only time constraint as far as I, I can see it. So I want to make sure I have these dates correct because I'm like writing them down. I don't have a calendar in front of me. So I have the 678 Pratt Corner Road, May 24th. Is that a site visit or a meeting? That's a site visit. Okay. That's a site visit. And then we meet oh. on May 25th. For a regular public meeting. Okay. And we're also going to go to lot 032 at 530 on the 24th. I have that written down. Yeah. Um, I, I need to, well, I'm going to try and schedule the Pratt Corner. Okay. That's a meeting. Okay. Before that, I'd have to check with the landowner to see his availability. Okay. Thank you. But maybe I wanted... ideally we can do that at like four. four <laughs> I just wanted to clarify my notes. Yeah. Thanks. Um, okay. So, so yeah, if we maybe have two of our regular meetings, so on the 25th of May and the 8th of June, for us all to talk about the regulations yeah. and then sort of plan to have an actual public hearing, like you said, on like the 14th. And then maybe if, if needed, another one on the 28th. That seems to kind of work. Yeah. That'd be a lot of meetings for us in June, but. <laughs> a lot, but um, if we, I know it would be a lot of meetings, but um, yeah. it's a lot of work to do. In June, we're going to have some hearings for applications. So um, having it on a separate night seems like a good idea. So where it's not crowded in between a bunch mm -hmm. of permit applications. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. That sounds good. Um, so uh, yeah. So um, excited to have you guys take a look at this when it's ready. Um, and you know, you got a uh, hand raised. Yeah, Mark, you had your hand raised. Thank you. Uh, just a question is, how are we communicating out to every to the residents of the town that there is a public meeting? Um, you know, I. I uh, Right now, it's like I don't think there's a sense there's a there's a really good communication mechanism, uh, other than posting an agenda. Um, maybe we should look at uh, different email addresses, email forums, and say, you know, this is the this is the current bylaws, this is the proposed bylaws, and um, we're looking for your feedback. Like LWA, for example, is one is one group, you know, and. Yeah, um, I mean, I think that's a great, I think it's a great idea. Um, just so you know, Mark, there is a website that we have set up on our homepage that's dedicated to this. 
Um, so if you want to, if you share with information with people, they can go to that website and we'll give them updates. Um, mm -hmm. So once we get the draft um, ready for public release, we'll post it on that website so that you know, but people... you do, but you do understand that's kind of a passive approach to it. And no, I, I just no. I, what I was going to say is that you know, one of my thoughts was to have a town announce email. Oh, um, excellent. So yeah. I I think that um, we're not going to put in. We don't. We aren't required to put a newspaper notice in. Um, I don't know the, how effective that would be. Anyway, I I think um, like a town wide community email makes sense, and also then they can have a link to that website so people you know people the right now there's some frequently asked questions and there's a bunch of information on that website i don't know if is everybody on the commission had a chance to look at it mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's good so are we we're, we were planning i thought to send this to send the draft to um, the town committees prior to public meetings for their so they have an opportunity to look at it and send comments yeah, I thought we would at the time that we put it up on our website, um, that when it's public, uh, we would also send it to the select board and the board of health. And um, I don't know what, you know, we can make a decision on that at that point of what committees we might want to, you know, send it to um, planning board. Um, and I don't know who else. It's a, it's a pretty tight schedule if you're going to do that before we do the public hearing, but. Well, um, okay. I just I, it's just a question as to when we're going to send it to to those committees, and I, which I think should go prior to pub, to the public meeting. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, that's why I was hoping to be able to do it all on May by May twenty fifth, so that there would be like maybe three weeks um, for people to read through the document and if before the public first public hearing, and if we need to have a second public hearing. We can have, I mean, we can have three public hearings. I mean, I think we need to see well, how much time we need to hear from people. How does that sound? Sounds good. Good. Yeah. How's that for you, Mary? That's fine. I just, like I said, I just want to make sure we, we had said we would get it to them that we put yes. that in the plan. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, uh, can I ask a question here? Sure, Mark here. Yeah, is there is there any plan to have a in person like a uh, like a meeting meeting as opposed to a, a Zoom meeting for something of you know, this nature? No, I don't think so. Mm. And and why are we you know what you know what's the logic behind not having a public forum anymore? Uh, well, I think we are having a public forum by having these meetings in the format we're having them. This is a public forum. Well, but it's not a forum that many of many people that I know can attend. It's like you know, I I deal with a lot of elderly people that just don't have email access and don't have you know the sophistication. Not that you know the sophistication. You know, they just, they're just not doing with Zoom meetings, but yet they have historical knowledge and, and they have a lot of value um, that, you know, would, um, you know, would be in, you know, would, be, would be helpful. Uh, you know, for example, it's just a simple LWAC meetings that we have is we, you know, we have them now in, you know, as a hybrid meetings and we have people you know, that are involved that are bring historical knowledge and, and, and value that they wouldn't participate in a Zoom meeting. So but you, don't, you don't allow the public in person for your meetings, do you? People abs can we, we absolutely do. We meet at the town hall and by and via Zoom. Oh, it's, a, it's a hybrid meeting. I thought I thought it was uh, closed to the public in town hall. Okay. That's absolutely see, not the case. I see Mark, somebody- here's an idea. You reserve the um, senior lounge for these meetings and you have your computer or someone has a computer and people who don't have internet access can come and attend the meeting in the room with you. Um, that's what LWAC does currently. Isn't that an idea. 
Yeah, no, that, LVAC is doing that right now. And so, you know, people who don't feel comfortable with Zoom meetings come to the town hall. And uh, those who prefer to be Zoom meetings you know, participate online. And the town hall has the, the tech, uh, you know, has the infrastructure to support that. Um, I, I think we need to consider this some more. And I think, you know, we need to move on. Um, I think we need to think about it. And I'd want to talk with um, my land use, our land use clerk to see how she would feel because um, about doing the hybrid option, I, I personally am not interested in um, being personally present for the meeting. I would prefer to do it by Zoom. And um, I think doing it by Zoom in general provides opportunity for a lot of public participation that wouldn't happen with an in, a fully in-person meeting. So, um, yeah, you know, I totally agree. Maybe we can be creative and find a way to accommodate uh, folks um, in town hall who want to participate in a way. Um, I also want to be just mindful of who's taking the minutes and what challenge that might present for the person taking the minutes. Oh, good point. Sorry. I know the phone's quality, as, oh. as a person who's participated in some of those hybrid meetings, I know the sound quality is not great. And it's hard to hear what people are saying. So maybe if we had a microphone that people could be speaking into, it's just, you know, might be difficult um, to, so that's something to think about. I saw Aaron that you had your hand raised and then I think we need to move on to our, we have a little bit more discussion. Yeah. So. Thank you. I was just gonna say for, for parents with children, it's nearly impossible to get out in the evening for a meeting at town hall so it excludes a huge portion of the community too for you know people who don't have child care for night meetings yes understood yeah um okay um that sounds great that we'll we'll try to figure out some ways to be creative about this if if necessary um we certainly want to make sure that people have opportunities for feedback and and if somebody wants to provide written feedback and can't attend the public hearing, you know, they can provide testimony or comments and we certainly will take that into account if so. There are different avenues for information, I think. Um, so I just had a placeholder for us to be start talking about developing a new bylaw and wanted to just open the floor to the commission to do some brainstorming for a few minutes before we end our meeting. Um, I know it's late, but um, I want to make sure we're paying attention to this. Uh, so um, I thought just thinking a little, maybe starting as a starting place, just talking a little bit about what our priorities might be. If we were to draft a new bylaw, what are things we might want to keep, things we might want to change? Mm, I think I think that would involve a more in-depth look at the bylaw than I've done. <laughs> right. little, yeah, but I, I do like, I think that. we have talked a little bit about, um, you know, starting with the MACC uh, sort of current template bylaw, you know, um, which certainly includes a lot more information in it than our current bylaw does. Um, but uh, I don't, well, I have the template on our website. So you guys can go to our that homepage and download it if you haven't already, as well as uh, links to the bylaw. So you can download that. And I think I put some That's links, cool. other communities bylaws, if you wanna look at some other examples. Okay. So, um, maybe we'll table it, but say, um, you know, in the next month or so when you have some time to go and look at those resources and um, so we can be prepared to start thinking about that. Okay. Mark, you had your hand raised. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'd be interested in understanding what's wrong with our current bylaws. And so uh, I like a little, uh, you know, kind of a, a synopsis of, you know, what's wrong with what we have and, 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 and that's a starting point. Well, that's a really good question. And, and just as an FYI, I have a note here to say this. So I, I'm glad you said that, Mark, because you're right on, on, on cue. Um, I did ask Donna McNichol for a legal opinion about our current bylaw. And I 
asked her to give us some guidance about which sections, if any, um, would be unenforceable. Um, I know there's a couple of things about the bylaw that um, we, which are not enforceable in the way it's written. Um, and, but I'm not aware that all of it is unenforceable. So I needed, to, we, I think getting an opinion from her would be very helpful. And what about the, the actual review that was done by McGregor McGregor? Then, then we actually see that. I, again, can't remember if we actually saw their comments on the bylaw. We saw a letter an email, a letter, an email, which I've sent to you guys. Um, and I don't have it in front of me, so I can't paraphrase it. Um, it wasn't clear that there was anything he was specifically saying was invalid about the bylaw. It sounded like a lot of his comments were about why we would need regulations and what should be in regulations. And um, I asked Beth Goodman to look at his letter and she wrote us a letter with her opinion that um, she didn't do a review of the bylaw, but she reviewed his letter and said that her read of his letter was that he was not saying that the bylaw was unenforceable or invalid, right. but, that, but, but that the deficiencies were um, mostly with the lack of, of good regulations and well-developed definitions and performance standards. Okay. So that was what, Don, that's what Beth Goodman said, who is a, um, an attorney that uh, we had uh, retained. And so I'm asking our town council to also give us an opinion about that. And um, the plan is that our town council will do a review of the draft regulations as well um so that when we have a public hearing we can also have her attend if there's any comments she wants to make about them okay amar i see hands raised um and i i think it's getting late so i don't think we're gonna have a lot of just more discussion but i'll let a couple more comments and i think we're going to move on um mark yeah, is this uh, is this letter uh, from I forgot the name of the company uh, or the group, but is that available? Is that part of the minutes of the meetings? And should it be? Um, I don't know that it's attached to the minutes. I believe those letters have been referenced in the minutes, and they are a public record. So, if they're referenced, are they available to the public? Um. They, they will. They, what? I was just going to say, they were asked for by the select board, right? The select board asked McGregor to look at the bylaw. Yes. So it's a town document. So I would think if you wanted to see it, you would contact the select board. Okay, great. That sounds that sounds reasonable. And then the letter that was received by the Conservation Commission from Beth Goodman, um, you know, is in response to that letter. So it might be useful to look at both letters, but, uh, you know, we, we're getting a lot of information from attorneys and we're gonna get some more information from town council. So um, we'll see. My understanding is that, um, and this is what I know, Mark, I'm just sharing it. Um, you know, the bylaw has a clause in it called sever a severability clause, which means that if any one particular provision of the bylaw becomes invalidated either by a new statute or by case law court decision, the rest of the bylaw still stands. It doesn't invalidate the entire bylaw. Um, and there's two things I know of that are a little wonky about our bylaw. One is that it doesn't include an exemption for agriculture. And since the bylaw was passed, there's been state law passed that exempts um, agricultural practices from um, local regulation. 
So that's the one wonky issue. And then the second wonky issue is that in the enforcement provision, it has kind of a sliding scale for fees, for fines, I mean. It says up to $300. And there's been a court decision which said you can't have up to up to a number. You have to have defined penalties so that potential violators know in advance what their penalty is going to be. You can't have it be left indeterminate. So um, that language is not valid. But um, I, in my experience on the commission, we've never levied a fine. So it's not something that hinders us particularly. Is that making sense? Mm -hmm. Joe? Is that Joe Salvador? Hi, how are you doing? Hi, Joe. Uh, I can get copies of both of those from both lawyers? Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know how to do this. Um, should I just put these up on the web? I, you know, should I put these on our website so that you know people can just get access to them? Without I think we need to check to see if that's a legitimate thing to do. Uh, because they're um, because they're legal opinions. Legal opinions. Um, I, I yeah. I, though I think that they're public because we we discuss them in meetings. We reference them. So I think that once we discuss something in a public meeting, it's really, it's not privileged. It's open to the public. Yeah, it's open to the public. I don't think it's something that is a privileged communication. Um, but I, I, on these documents, it reference the actual, what rules they say are one says one thing, one says something else. So both lawyers are kind of debating on certain parts of it. I no, I, I, don't th I don't think that's, that's not my read. I think they're actually in agreement with each other. My interpretation was that they both were agreeing with each other. All right. If you post it, if you put it on your website, that'd be great because I can. So, I so just so you understand, so because the very, I want to make sure you understand that. So we're talking about the regulations. This is what the discussion started with, was our updating our regulations because we were advised by town council that our regulations were out of date, and that. Um, a bylaw needs to have regulations in order to be fully enforceable. Um, and so we have been working on doing that. There are existing regulations, but they're, they're not very detailed. And many commissions now are developing much more detailed regulations than the ones that we have that were drafted in the year 2000, 1999, 2000. So, you know, this is an evolving best practice statewide. And um, almost all commission, all towns that have wetland bylaws also have bylaw regulations. And so to give you an example, when you go on our website, I have links to several towns regulations. So you can look at what other towns have done just to get an idea of what they look like. Um, because I thought it would be helpful to take some of the mystery out of it. And if you look at them, you'll see that many of them really are saying they're very similar. A lot of it is just scientific information about um, the values of different resource areas, the definitions of different things. Um, what is a vernal pool? You know, What is land subject to flooding? What is an isolated wetland? Um, what are our standards for protecting these things? So. That's what these are to a large part. And then the other part of regulations are just kind of instructions about how applications work. You know, what are what are the procedures for applications so that it's all standardized? All right. Is that helpful? Yeah, I'm just gonna wait till I see it online and I can yeah. go work with it and go sure. from there. Okay. I can pass it on. Carrie, did you have your hand raised? Yeah, I understand that there was a question because if it's a legal document, if it should be posted on the website. And I was just going to suggest that if anyone wants either of these letters, that they can just also ask um, Grace through a public a public records request to obtain these as well. Yes, absolutely. You can do it that way. Um, and, you know, um, they've been discussed in meetings. And, and so, you know, there's no mystery here. There's want to be fully transparent about it. 
Okay, thank you. And you guys can put your hands down or do you have more questions? I want to kind of move on. Okay, all right. Um, I think we're done for tonight. I don't think there's anything left on the agenda. Was there anything I've missed? No. Okay. We're done. Sounds good. <laughs> all right. Okay, so um, I'll be in touch about those scheduling those visits. Okay. I need a motion to adjourn. Second. Dean, mm -hmm. yep. Okay, David. Aye. Um, Defont, aye. Harrington. Aye. Um, um, aye. And Wilson. Aye. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night.